after leaving Exmouth, we spent a few days cruising up the coast and we got to the Montebello Islands. So the Montebello's group, it's about 70 limestone islands and it was also the site of Australia's largest nuclear test, uh, which was in June of 1956. So when we were getting around on the islands, we had to be careful. Um, they, they recommend that you only have a very, very limited time, one hour per day on the islands, uh, which we did, we did stick to. Um, but further to that, a lot of the Montebello Islands on the inside um, is unsurveyed. So you can see that we're, we, you know, we had to really take our time, uh, check it out and work the tides to get through some of those gaps. And some of them were really narrow and we really had to exercise a fair bit of caution. The first island we visited in the Montebello group was Tremool Island, which was the site of two nuclear tests, one in 1952 and one in 1956. The first was an ocean surface blast which exploded the HMS Plym, and the second was a top of 31 metre tower. Our stays were limited to one hour a day, but there were plenty of animals on, on the island that uh, they had no choice and it didn't seem to be doing them much harm. All of them had two arms, two legs, one tail, one head. But there was goannas, wallabies, um, just, just loads of wildlife. And here we found the skull of one of the, the wallabies. It gives you some idea of just how small these things are. They look like supercharged rats flying around the place. So it looks like a lockable bulkhead, a ladder. This looks very much like a ship that's been blown up by an atom bomb. I'm surprised there's any, any of it. You'd think it'd sort of be vaporised, but that looks very much like a watertight door over there. So the whole construction looks pretty much like you'd expect from a ship. So we've just walked over the narrowest part of the island that you can see behind me, and we're off to catch some crays. I hope we're, um, I hope we're going to be successful. Looking forward to a little bit of lobster. Size lobster <laughs> in there. Then we got a pretty decent sized lobster. <laughs> Not bad. <laughs> yeah, put him there. Then we got a bit of a horse here. <laughs> Get along again. Oh, he's gone. He's, he's a bit annoyed this one. He's been tailed down. Legs out. So. That's getting up there for a lobster. Put him there. And then, <laughs> what is this? <laughs> Look at it. Look at it. <laughs> it nearly caught me while I was catching it. <laughs> what a lobster. Let's have a look at the arm. Oh. Give me a love bite, this thing. <laughs> yeah, that's a bit too great. So. Wow. Hand caught. Mm. Alright, well, we've got enough crayfish, this is just too much of me, so we're gonna, we're gonna put this one back. <laughs> <laughs> like a beach whale. Look at that big bow like con. <laughs> Looks like a shark taking off. Oh man. Oh well. You see it when it was out of the water, it was all just like, oh, shit, nothing much is going on. As soon as it went back in, it was. Bam. Gone. Yeah, we got enough crayfish. Lives another day. We didn't need that. 
<laughs> oh, another day at the gym. It's an interesting exercise technique. Working on the wrong machine. Just to get ready in the Kimberleys, we act as a fishing guide so you can catch all those micro mm. We caught a few crows, we let the biggest one go. Saw that. We gave the next biggest one to some of our new friends. So give them some lunch before they head off. And what we've got left is a pretty medium sized female. I know she's female because she's got these little patches here. That's to receive uh, male sperm. And then later on as she's laying eggs, she'll self fertilize those. And this little male here, I guess everything's relative. Oh, knocked his antennas off on the walk home. And I know it's a male because, well, look, what are these things? I shouldn't really be touching them, should I? But there you go. So there you go, those little spurs, if you like. That's a male. So the female, she's nowhere near carrying eggs because if you look under here, she hasn't grown all really extensive fur and she doesn't have a tar spot. Like normally she would have a big black spot of the male sperm there that she'd hold on to. Mm. So that's, um, I reckon that's lunch for us. Straight through the chest cavity, that's where the main nerve bundle is. Tails hung immediately limp. That crayfish is uh, pretty much done for. Okay, here's that um, little male, and that's a sperm sack there. Up in the islands, the Thursday islands around Queensland, just in the cray fleet, they call it PK. It's like PK chewing gum, they actually chew on that. So I'm probably not in the practice of chewing on lobster sperm. Some people are. What does it taste like? I don't know, I've never tried it. Would you like some lobster sperm? <laughs> no thanks. <laughs> Why not? Be open to new experiences. No, a lot of the local TI guys love it. I don't know whether they actually know it's lobster sperm because they just call it PK. But there you go. If you're ever adventurous and you got yourself a lobster, there's a new taste sensation for you. We'd heard that there were mud crab on the Montebello Islands and we'd had a look at the charts and seen a place called Turtle Lagoon and we thought it'd be a good candidate. Yeah, I think so. And even if we didn't catch any crabs, we figured that anything called Turtle Lagoon would be good for sightseeing anyway. Although it probably shouldn't be called Turtle Lagoon, it's more like Stingray Lagoon. Yeah, they were pretty friendly. Here's Pascalo Crab Finder. She's got the Gigi without the head on it. All the better to poke into holes and see what's going on. And she's working on her balance. Looks like a stingray swimming off to your right there, Pascal, out towards those logs. It didn't take Pascal long to find a mud crab, and then it was up to me to try and catch it, but you really have to be careful with mud crabs because those nippers can almost take a finger off. They can definitely crush bone, so it takes a little bit of finesse. <laughs> Mud crab. Mm. How do we know it's female? Because that tail section's a big oval. If it was a male, that would be sharp, coming up to a point, and then down again. And those claws would be a lot bigger. Mm. I reckon those ones would still hurt though. That's a that's a fat girl though. Yeah, ladies go free. Not get in free, get away free. <laughs> Like, what was the point of all that? Shoo. After mucking around with the crab as we went further on, we just found a load of rays. They were the majority called mangrove rays, and there was also some leopard rays amongst them, but they're very, very mild-tempered, and uh, we really enjoyed their company, actually. They were very cool. Stingray behind you, Dar. Here's my foot and another stingray. Mm. You gotta be quick. 
quick to turn that choke off when you start it. Where are we going? Somewhere. Oh, there we go. Quick, quick, quick. That's some reps. to go to some new coral bombies and we were towing the dinghy behind us and then something happened. Can you tell us a bit more about what happened Troy? I can. Normally whenever we tow the dory or the dinghy whatever you want to call it um, we take the motor off the back so we just found it safer. This time it looked pretty moderate here we were only just going over there so we didn't bother and um, because we broke from our normal protocol, of course, the dinghy, dinghy flipped and the outboard went for a swim. So, if you are going to swim an outboard, can I suggest a Yamaha two-stroke? Because all the electrics are nicely sealed. Um, there's no oil in the sump. A two-stroke, so I just I mainly need to get the water out of the cylinders, uh, the water out of the magneto. I'll check the gearbox here, see what the... I don't think there should be oil, it's used to being underwater, but we'll check anyway, it might have worked its way down. Um, and that's basically it, so we've got to pull it apart, soak it uh, with a water dispersant. I'm using WD-40, but also diesel and plenty of fuel is going to be used. I've convinced Pascal to let me use the stainless steel bowl. Um, it's got, it should be easy to clean, but might have to do a bit of sweet talking there. What else can I recommend? If you've never pulled an engine apart before, have a means of taking photos as you go along. Because you might get to a stage and just go, what have I done? Um, if you take any outboard to a mechanic, if you can get to a mechanic, we can't. We like to be in remote areas. But um, if you took it to a mechanic like that, you just rubbing his hands together and just add another 100% to the price, I imagine. So take some photos as you go. It, uh, it'll help you re-navigate your way back to a, a reconstructed engine. carburetor, we've got the water out of the cylinder, we've uh, got the oil out of the gearbox and put all new oil in. Um, hose down all the magneto, WD-40 and I even sanded off the little magnets there so everything's looking not too bad. I haven't, um, I haven't really filled up the fuel tank with fuel, I've just got enough to just kick her over and test her um, and that's just, if I miss something then That'll have to be emptied, so we don't want to waste any um, any more fuel than we have to. We've got a few nasty rags left over now, but um, that's all right. When we pull into Karatha, we can. I've got a waste oil drum, so we can put that in there. Hopefully, they've got a waste oil uh, waste rag depository there. So we'll stick this on the back of the dory that caused all the trouble, um, and pull her over a few times. I can't do it up here, obviously, because this is a water-cooled engine, so it needs to be in the water. If I was back at home, so, well I am at home now, but if I was back in a workshop or something I'd just stick that in a barrel of water right, right near the bench, but we don't have that luxury here, so we're gonna, gonna stick it on the dinghy. It was a little bit smoky, um, 
So I actually ran a little bit more two-stroke oil through the fuel and I'm, I'm going to do that. The next tank I put in, instead of uh, hundreds of one, which is the Yamaha mix that this engine's running on, I'll double that so it'll be uh, 50 to 1. 50 parts fuel to 1 part oil. Hell, I might give it a bird bag at 25 to 1. Just go crazy, just smoke it up wherever I go. But those insides are going to want some oil. This is a two-stroke, so it doesn't have, uh, it doesn't have its own lubricating system. The oil is in the fuel. There we go. That was fully uh, fully underwater. It was at keel level. <laughs> and uh, now it's back up in the air and breathing again. I don't know, foreign rubbish, Yamaha. So we found a spot that says dangerous rock on the GPS. We love dangerous rock. We love dangerous rock. And it's in the channel. So we're thinking it's going to be a plenty with mangrove jack and perhaps some striped sea perch, maybe some coral trout as well. We'll just have to have a look and see. So this looks amazing. Here's Pascal with a mouthful of sushi. <laughs> here's, here's with a mouthful of sushi. <laughs> so what have we um, made for us? What are we looking at here? Mm. Spicy tuna sushi, nori rolls. Mm -hmm. And then nigiri with um, stripey sea perch, raw. And yellow fin tuna, yellow tail tuna. Yellow fin tuna. Yellow fin tuna. And then these ones here are coral trout. And then there's some more yellow fin tuna. So reef fish and tuna. Sushi. Nice. Mm -hmm. With some wasabi and some soy. That's the legit wasabi as well. Mm -hmm. And I guess it's uh, kikaman. So, yeah, there you go. Soy. Mm -hmm. Reef fish and tuna. Japanese feast, hmm. complete with green tea. Oh. There's Cheers. the maestro, the chef. As we were opened the engine room today to get going to move to a, another anchorage, uh, we've discovered that the exhaust is broken. Uh oh. Uh oh. Uh -oh. What do we do? <laughs> with some assistance from Cole's Italian whole peeled tomato pieces, which we've eaten. We do have an empty can here, so I'm going to apply some tools to this. We're going to make up a metal sleeve and put it on. Unfortunately, it's on a bent bit of pipe, um, so it might need a little bit of... I don't know. I don't know what it's going to need. We're just going to have a go at it. So you've joined us right at the start of this little adventure. This repair is going to necessitate pulling out everything on the boat because everything that we need is at the bottom of everything else. And that's part of living on a boat. Basically the backbone of this repair is this bit of tin we've cut from the Coles tomato. Thank you Coles. We're going to have a bit of an overlap there. All right. Um, a spiral so because like it's, it is on the bend and then we're going to hose clamp that like crazy and then insulation and then no marine repair is complete without gaffer tape so, so we've got a trusty screwdriver I love this screwdriver <laughs> don't I look what's in here 
you can always find the right blade for the job. I don't know how I didn't drop that in the bilge then. That is, it's all part of repairing a boat, isn't it? Just dropping everything that you love in the bilge. Huh! Bloody hell, it worked, huh? All right, so we just had a half hour test run then. I had the head saw up just to take the load off. We were doing about four knots. I was just pootling along at about 1500 RPM. Um, and it's held. So that's the crux of it really. So the metal reinforcing has held it rigid. The uh, insulation and the tape. The tape seems a little bit hot. It's gone a bit soft. But um, I felt the whole thing and it's, it's sound. We had a little bit of exhaust still leaking, but uh, it's definitely enough for us to get out of here, then we can sail to Dampier, and then we'll go in search for a muffler guy. So as we were pulling up the anchor, we saw a, a gang of squid, and uh, Troy took it upon himself to throw the jig out. He's slimed. And he's been sli slimed. Slimed hard. So what have we got in the bucket? You might have to pull that inside. Big eyes. So they were using the boat for shade, I guess. And as we as we left anchor, and Pascal saw them, raised the cry, squid. And now we've got some lunch, which is great. So at the start of the video, I was describing that the Monte Bellows is basically uncharted waters. So what we generally do is we pick a rising tide to go through areas that we're uncertain about, and we use the current lines and flots them in the water to find. Uh, the deeper channels, they tend to indicate really accurately where the deeper channels can be and where we can find safe water. So here I'm just up on the, the top of the boat and I'm conning it, so I'm just giving instructions back to Pascal, uh, go left, go right, because I can see clearly and then she just steering by foot, follows the path and through we go. So here's Pascal sorting out some of the squid that we caught earlier with a a knife looks a little bit blunt nowadays. As we were coming into this anchorage, I saw a, a bunch of fish curves on the sounder. So I've convinced her that as she's gutting these squid to put a little bit on the hook, so we'll see what, <laughs> what eventuates from that. So any thoughts so far, Pascal, of the fishing in the, in the Montebellos? Pretty good. Pretty Plenty of squid. Been pretty steady, hasn't it? Snapper, lots of coral trout to spear. I can, uh, I can see myself just wearing underpants and glasses. <laughs> <laughs> I if that will come through on the video. You're getting your fingers under the wings, pulling the skin off. Here I am gutting the squid and I was very careful, or well, I was being very careful to keep those metallic blue sacks there. They're the ink sacks of the squid because we wanted to make squid ink pasta. I removed the ink from those sacks and mixed them in a little uh, white plastic bowl there. To make the pasta, we fried squid and fish with garlic and ghee. And then we just boiled pasta with olive oil and salt, the usual way. And then we added the squid ink to the pasta. And then we stirred through the fish and the garlic and the um, squid and then added some of that, the pasta cooking water so it didn't become too stodgy. So it was a nice silky black sauce. And we ran out of space in our saucepan, so we had to start mixing it in our big stainless silver, silver bowl. Here we've got some squid ink pasta. I haven't had it before. Have you ever been watching one of those shows and someone cooks something up and you, you want them to have a taste and then just spit it out? They always say, oh, it's delicious, and you're disappointed. Well, this might be one of those moments. Let's have a look. Not bad. Nice. What do you think, Pascal? 
Okay, that's delicious. Yeah, I think so as well. I've had it before and it's been too much ink, but we've got just the right amount here. Okay, so well, it's good to see your lips, your chin. Black. They're black. Your teeth. Gives a smile. <laughs> yeah. All right. So we like to try and use it, all the bits of the seafood, so mm. I guess that's just one more thing. What does cooking squid ink pasta do to your kitchen? <laughs> Survey the chaos. <laughs> black. A bit more black. More black. <laughs> And it just goes back to being orderly again, so... Not really. <laughs> the skull... It's pretty chaotic. It is a bit chaotic, really isn't it? I'm feeling a little bit anxious about it right now. Oh yeah? Yeah. Because it's on film or just in general? Just generally. Well, we sail tomorrow, so don't worry about it. We'll sort it out. <laughs> After we go snorkeling here and get some more lobsters. Mm -hmm. Just baiting the hook to catch some snapper. What's the bait of the day? Squid, of course. Squid, of course. <laughs> Everybody loves squid. They do. Oh, good cast. <laughs> That's it. Let the rod take the shots. Oh, easy. So I thought. What went snap then? Was that just you closing the bail arm? No. <laughs> it's the fish fighting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a bigger one. It's what we want. Oh, that's a solid little spang guy. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> it's fighting. That's it. Up she comes. Mmm, delicious. <laughs> What do you got? <laughs> Spangled Emperor. <laughs> nice. We have a suspicion there might be a few crayfish here. The scale's putting her gloves on. She's going to see if she can put a feed on the table today. Right at the end of where the gill cover is, <laughs> that is finished. Nothing else going on there. It's instantly dead fish. I'm gonna go check out this hole here that's been created with the low tide. Sandbar here, with a big ocean out there, and um, that's Trimble Island. amazing snorkel right here. I'm having a good time seeing lots of fish. Crayfish, really beautiful, very peaceful.